I think uh, we're a couple of minutes after uh, three now, so I think maybe it's time to begin to get going, uh, to be sensitive uh, for people's time. Um, thank you for joining us today on the COVID-19 survival toolkit uh, presentation. I think this is the fourth or fifth in our series of presentations um, to help entrepreneurs be more effective uh, in these difficult times. Um, my name is uh, Paul Barter. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur in residence at the Rec Center. Um, and this speaker series is intended to target, to share targeted tips from tech experts with practical insights and stories from the front lines. Um, the Rick Center is pleased to host this session in partnership with innovation hubs in Ontario, including Alltech, Innovation Factory, Innovate Niagara, Innovation Guelph, Tech Alliance, and WeTech. The speakers are select domain experts, successful entrepreneurs, and innovation enthusiasts. Uh, and they're committed to helping uh, our tech uh, innovation ecosystem remains strong. After we hear from both presenters, we'll open up for discussion with all participants through the chat uh, uh, function at the bottom of the screen. Um, uh, I will ask you to mute your microphones uh, uh, until we get to the, to the uh, Q&A session to make sure that uh, we don't get any distractions. So today we've got um, two great speakers, um, Kirian Tarakan, Managing Director at Strategy Peak and Costas uh, from Web for Realty, who's been a Rick Center client for quite some time. And, and the topic again is priming the sale. Um, we're going to begin with uh, Kirian uh, in a minute, but while we're just getting set up, um, uh, Jenny from the Rick Center is going to uh, start with a little poll um, to get your perspective. So uh, why don't you answer the poll while we're um, we're getting set up, and uh, then we'll get uh, get Costas uh, lined up. Okay, Jenny, and maybe uh, you could on share your screen and uh, we'll let Kurian um, share his. And Kirin, we can see your screen, just, so just put it in presentation mode and we're, we're ready to go. All right. <coughs> Oops, out of presentation mode. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Uh, okay, perfect. We need you back in presentation mode. Yeah, I'll do it right away here. How's that? Good. There we go. Yes. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me to present today. Uh, my name is Kieran Therican. I am an executive of residence at Tech Edmonton. I'm also the managing director of Strategy Peak Sales and Marketing Advisors. I will be happy to send you a copy of this deck after. I'll show you how you, tell you how you can do that, and uh, you'll have that for reference. So in the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to uh, go through a variety of techniques that uh, we use we advise our clients on. So I'm a sales and marketing consultant. Uh, I'm a go-to-market strategy uh, advisor at Tech. And uh, we use these techniques as a, a peppering of tactics. It's certainly not strategy, but it's a peppering of tactics to help you either unstick or get started your entry into the, uh, into the marketplace. And hopefully, maybe do a little bit more. Maybe actually get, uh, get some scale going as well. The one thing it clearly will not do is fix a broken product. So if your product uh, is not ready for prime time, you can do all the strategy you want, all the tactics you want, uh, that will not fix a broken product design. So you really have to go and figure that out from the beginning. 
But if your product does have some merit, if you've got some initial traction, some initial market validation, then this will help you get a little bit more speed out of the discussion. So we're going through a number of different tactics today. A lot of them are psychologically based. Uh, and we're going to start off with the very first one. It's called social proof. Now, social proof is simply that we look to people that are like us to decide what we should do if they're already doing something similar. So we're, if they're doing something, maybe we should try it as well, or maybe we should do it in a similar manner. And that way we can stay safe, get out of pain, and maybe move to gain. So this is a, the lowly shopping cart. Now retailers love shopping carts because it allows you to buy more. There's no such thing as a small shopping cart at Costco, for example. The thing is, in 1937, when the, social, when the uh, shopping cart was first invented, it was invented by a fellow, that uh, had uh, the ownership. He had already created his first several million dollar empire with the Humpty Dumpty uh, grocery, store, grocery store chain in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And he realized that he could get people to buy more if they had bigger baskets. Well, he went even a step further and he invented the shopping cart. Now here's the problem. It was an absolute dud in adoption. And women thought it made them look like they were pushing a pram and men thought it made them look effeminate. So what this fellow had to do, the owner of the Humpty Dumpty chain, he hired models to show everybody how it's done. This is how you do it. You move, you prance this way, put stuff in and the shopping cart took off because he was able to model the change, use social proof in order to get the adoption of this device. And of course we've been buying more ever since. Prospect self-qualification. It's, it's important to know that everybody that is in your prospect funnel is not a prospect for you. So the more you can do to get them to self-qualify themselves in, and just as importantly, self-qualify themselves out was going to save you a lot of time because it will allow them to actually, for, it'll allow you to actually focus on what is important, the most important prospects in that funnel. Now, there was, uh, we've probably all been victims of uh, this at some point in time. I certainly laugh when I see it come through. The Nigerian scam, okay, and it usually it goes like this. And it's called the 419 scam in the UK. Okay, there's actually a whole department there that is associated with, you know, scamming uh, this kind of stuff, the uh, 419 scams. But, you know, it typically goes like this. I'm a Nigerian prince. I've got access to 26 million bucks of money. I need somebody offshore to help me ferret this money out. And for your, your largesse, I'm going to pay you 30% of the proceeds, uh, maybe a few million bucks. And, of course, you've got all sorts of people, you know, that are falling victims to them. And you've got to remember, these are professional criminals. So they are not people that you want to toy with. So why would they make such outlandish, unbelievable promises, claims, impossible scenarios? it's because they want you to self-qualify. Because Microsoft actually did a paper on this. They did a huge study on this. They uh, analyzed millions of these uh, scam emails. And here's the most important part of this. The Nigerian scam artists are very smart. They realize that sending out millions upon millions of emails are just pennies on the email. The real cost is reeling in the people that they will eventually swindle. And you don't want to reel in smart people that'll quickly figure it out. So you only want the most gullible. It's a self-qualification prospect. Now this is self-qualification go, gone wrong. I get it. But even if the Nigerians are doing it, we could probably use it in a good way. Contrast. Nothing is hot unless it's compared to something that is cold. It can't be warm unless it's something that is compared to something hotter or colder. So contrast is a big part of how our brains decide what to go for next. Now, here's an example of an illusion called the Ebbing House illusion. You see that center dot there, the orange dot? I'm gonna put up another one here. See those two dots? Which one is bigger? And of course the answer is they're both the same size. But because they are placed in relationship to the outer dots, the gray dots, what looks bigger is actually the same size as what looks smaller because it's the contrast of the dots around it. So contrast is a very, very powerful uh, step to allow people's brains to lock down on the next step. Now, here's an example of a um, study done by Dan O'Reilly in his university class. And he used it in uh, what's known as a decoy price. And decoy price is not meant to do anything else other than to introduce contrast to the situation. Here's what he did. 
100 students, you offer them, them the following, $59 for a subscription, digital subscription to The Economist magazine, or $125 for the digital and the print subscription. When he added up the revenue, 68 people chose only digital, 32 people chose the uh, digital and print for a combined revenue of a little over $8,000. Now, if you're an amateur marketing person, you say, hey, great, let's go out and celebrate. If you're a professional marketer, you'll say, let's beat that baseline. So here's what he did. He uh, put up the following thing. So internet only, which is the digital, $59. Print only, $125. Print and digital, $125. Do you see anything odd there? Well, it's the center price, the central option. That is the decoy. It's clearly an inferior option. But here's what it did. It pushed people to see the contrast between the three offers. And it pushed more people to choose the digital and print. So you were able to bring home another $3,000 in revenue simply by adding a little contrast in the pricing. Lots of different uh, studies like this have been done over the years. And uh, back in like 19, I believe 82, uh, there's a couple of researchers down at Duke University. And here's what they did with the college students down there and beer price. Now, if you're a college student, you probably know a lot about beer. At least you know a little something about beer. Now, this is 1982 pricing. Here's what they did. They gave you the option of two different uh, beer uh, beers. First of all, there's a budget beer, which is rated on a quality, say, uh, quality scale of 50. And that was for $1.80. Then there's a premium beer, quality 70 out of 100, for $2.60. When they put these two beers together, two-thirds of the people went for the premium beer. Only one-third of the people went for the budget beer. Then they switched it up. Now they offered an additional option to induce contrast. They put a bargain bin basement sub there, quality 40, lowly 40, buck 60 in price, kept the budget and premium uh, beers in place. And when they offered all three, no one chose the bargain bin. And then what happened is that 47% chose the budget and 53% chose the premium. And you can see the previous uh, experiment, right? See so the actual spread now, it's a little different. Then they did a final experiment. They introduced a super premium quality SUD, and that was rated on a 75 out of 100, and 10% of the students went for the super premium SUDs. And 90% now went for the premium. No one went for the budget. Now, do you see what just happened here? All we did was we introduced a little contrast in the pricing and in the options available. Here's what happened. There was a 20% lift between the best and the worst cases here, just by experimenting with how you present the choices. And then the customer's mind does everything else. You wanna double the demand for your products? Simple way to do it, increase prices. Back in like the mid 80s, I believe it was like 83, 84, William Sonoma went out and they introduced a bread maker. Now I don't know how many people need a bread maker in their home, but William Sonoma definitely had one. And it was an immediate, flop and sales. Okay, so what do you do with that? Well, William Sonoma had the idea. Why don't we introduce a fancier bread maker? So they went out and put out a big premium bread maker and they priced it at $429, which also flopped in sales. But you know what happened? Because the larger $429 model now allowed contrast to take place in the prospect's minds, the sales of the smaller unit doubled because contrast was introduced. Contrast is a very, very powerful psychological phenomenon. Next concept, sequence the ask. Let's go to the zoo. University professor down in New York City, you know, ask goes out and asks his, uh, his class, I'd like you to help me with a project. I want you to come in every day this week. Uh, I'm sorry, every day this semester and next semester to help me out. Uh, or you can go out and, uh, and relieve yourself that responsibility simply by taking some young offenders down to the zoo. Now, he did two different versions of this. The very first thing he simply asked was, come and help me uh, with this. He always did that, uh, what is it? Um, Sorry, he always did the ask of uh, taking the young offenders to the zoo, right? But the very first way they did it was by asking them the overzealous 
request of helping the professor two hours a week for the remainder of the year. And that was very onerous for most people. When he pre-asked that question versus when he just asked people to take some young offenders to the zoo, and of course that sounds really safe to do, that I always want to be shanked down by the monkey cages by some young offenders. When he pre-asked it with the onerous request, it almost tripled the number of people saying, yes, I will take some young offenders to the zoo. This is an example of the door in the face technique. Ask something that people uh, will say no to or will have some hesitancy to, and then actually lower the request, and you're going to get a higher, much higher take up. And university professors aren't the only people that actually take, take this kind of psychology to heart. Marquita Andrews, the number one cookie seller in the Girl Scouts, was able to sell over 3,200 boxes of cookies to win the number one place in all of the USA for uh, cookie sales by doing one simple thing. Again, it's the door of the face technique. Here's what she said. When she went to the houses and knocked on the doors, she would immediately ask, can I have a $30,000 do donation for the Girl Scouts? And when they said no, well, would you at least buy some cookies then? And of course, that's how the door on the face works. Door on the face technique works for uh, the Girl Scouts. And she was able to bang out 3,200 boxes of sales in the process. So it's not merely enough to ask. You have to ask in a proper way. Door in the face, foot in the door, a number of different techniques that you can use. Your customers aren't customers. There's no such thing as a single customer. There's multiple types of customers. You have to de-average the customer. And so your one customer is actually multiple customers. And you have to come up with a product variation that appeals to these various segments. Way back when, in about 19, in the late 70s, early 80s, Prego had one type of tomato sauce. It was tomato sauce. You bought the Prego tomato sauce. And what they said was, you know, no matter what they tried to get the tomato sale, sauce sales up, they just couldn't go about doing it. And so from that perspective, you know, they said, you know, we need to segment this market more. Now, look at the Ford, uh, look at the quote from uh, Henry Ford above. The quote says, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Prego did not ask the people. They tested the marketplace instead. They hired a food um, researcher and he just made all sorts of different variations. And what ended up with, what he ended up with was over 19 different kinds of Prego, including extra chunky, which the focus groups never asked for, but all liked. So don't just ask people, also place uh, options in front of them to see what they actually bite down on. And eventually Ragu had to get in the game as well. So they have chunky, robusto, organic, light pizza, all these different variations to appeal to the various market segments. Sometimes we're just offering way too much cognitive complexity. There's way too many choices. Head and Shoulders was able to get their sales up by doing one simple thing. They took their shampoo lines from 26 different varieties down to 15. And as a result, because the cognitive complexity load was reduced, sales rose by 10%. The same experiment was done to test cognitive complexity uh, in the famous jam experiment. And the famous jam experiment, what they did is they, uh, it was at a uh, big Kroger's uh, food store, and they laid out the tables with different varieties of jams. First varieties were 24 varieties of jams. Then a couple of hours later, they were set it with six varieties of jam. Then they went back, fourth back, fourth, 24, six, six, 24. Here's what they found. A full whopping 60% of the people visited the tables with the large assortment. So 60% of the crowd walking by visited the table with the large assortment. But you as entrepreneurs are not interested in just traffic. You're interested in conversion. Here's the thing. The smaller table with just six jam varieties 30% of the visitors to that small table bought jam, while only 3% of the, of the visitors to the big table bought jam. 10 times more people bought jam when there was a smaller choice set. Now, I'm not saying do a smaller choice set or a larger, smaller choice set, larger choice set. I'm saying experiment with the choice set. Pricing and bundling, cognitive complexity again. You know? So what's better, buy two tubes of hand lotion and get one free, which is basically a 50% uh, bonus, or do you say buy three tubes of hand lotion and receive 33% of the total price? That's a lot of computational complexity. 
And so people have to engage the brains and there's a lot of heavy lifting involved, right? But here's what happens. When they positioned it as a bonus, 73% more hand lotion was sold when they positioned it as a bonus. And the only way you will really know that is by testing these various variations. So the real lesson is to experiment, you know? So 25% off is vastly um, pr preferred. Oh, sorry, let's see. 25% off plus an additional 20% off. You'll see this sometimes, you know, in double off sales as you go to the, to the uh, outlet malls and such is vastly preferred to the equivalent, mathematically equivalent, 40% off. Experiment with the pricing options. Nudge the customer. You know what that is? That's a razor from ancient Greece. This is, of course, a razor. That's a straight blade as well, right? Now, the thing is, what the Gillette company knows is that they sell a lot more disposable razors when they let people know when it's time to dispose of that razor. And here's what they do. They actually put a nice little bar in there, okay? When that little indicator strip turns uh, white, it's time to dispose of that razor. So a little bit of nudging, help people come to the decision to go forward. You don't leave your dentist, for example, without your next visit already programmed in. When are you coming in next year? Six months from now? Yes. And they book you in. They don't leave that up to you. They program in the purchase. Here's a real simple way to increase your persuasiveness by 2,352% with one simple change. You want to know what that is? Use default options. Uh, when they did the experiments, uh, I'm sorry, studies on organ donation rates in Europe, what they found was some countries had only 4.25% take up on uh, people willing to donate their organs in case they died. While some other countries had almost 100% take up. The only difference between those two countries, uh, those countries was the following thing. One was a default option. If you didn't say no, you automatically agreed to uh, donating your organs. Whereas the other one forced people into a choice and most people didn't choose at all. Default options can really get your, uh, your take up rates high. Use the awesome power of incentives. Amazon uh, did a, did a uh, buy one and a second book promotion in Europe and every country and get free shipping. And every country in Europe, except for France, took off in sales. When they examined what happened in France, there was a mistake. And instead of uh, free shipping, they offered shipping for one franc. So that was enough to just, come, just absolutely stomp down the demand for that. When they offered free shipping again, sales took off in France, just like in every other European country they did the promotion in. So don't underestimate what you can put in for free as an incentive to move forward. Incentives are sometimes the only thing saving a company. Uh, Sports Illustrated magazine was suffering greatly, suffering greatly in the mid 1980s and uh, declines in all sorts of subscriptions, advertising rates, all sorts of different things. And what, they, what saved them was this little thing down here, the football phone. This football phone down here is a line-based football phone. People over the age of 40 should know what that is, right? And uh, that was offered as a free gift for a subscription. 1.6 million new subscriptions were sold as a direct result of that particular promotion. What can you offer in the way of an incentive beyond the core offer? Rebranded. Hey, you want to eat some slime head? How about some toothfish? The problem with overfishing and global populations uh, doubling in order for uh, fishing to feed them is that you have to go out into deeper and deeper waters. And in those deeper and deeper waters, you get uglier and uglier fish. <laughs> so, you know, you, don't, you may not like the slime and the toothfish, but you know, you probably have seen orange roughy. That's the slime head. And that, that uh, toothfish, well, that is now rebranded to Chilean sea bass. Now, what would you rather eat? I know what I'd rather eat. And branding can offer all sorts of unintended consequences as well. What the uh, U.S. Uh, the US um, uh, department's responsible for hurricane studies. I forget exactly what they're called. You know, what they found was when you had a female named hurricane, that actually killed three times more people than male named hurricanes. Do you want to know why? When you hear Betty is coming to town or Debbie is coming to town, Susie is coming to town, it sounds kind of nice. 
You know, when you say or Frank is coming to town or Hank is coming to town, it sounds a little bit more scary. The nicer sounding names allowed people to say, you know, this isn't going to be so bad. I think I will just stay put instead of fleeing the place. And so you stay put, the hurricane comes in and kills three times more people. Now, if I was naming hurricanes, I'd name it Beelzebub, the son of Satan, is now patrolling off the coast of Miami. And I guarantee Miami would be a ghost town in a matter of minutes and millions of lives would be saved. Encourage usage, okay? You know, there's one hot sauce manufacturer that really wanted to get hot, sales, uh, hot sauce sales up. And no matter what advertising they did or whatever it was, they couldn't get hot, sales, hot sauce sales up. Now, there's usually only three ways to get sales up. You increase the number of customers, increase the amount of volume per sale, or increase the frequency of the transaction. But what if you also increase the frequency of use, right? Here's what they did. Bigger holes in the bottles. People just use more hot sauce. Boost your customer's motivation. Boost your customer's motivation. So back in 1934, the psychologist by the name of Clark Hull ran a whole bunch of different experiments with mice in maze. And what he found was that the mice, as they learned the maze, they figured out where the cheese was going to be. As they knew they were getting closer to the cheese, they increased their running to get to the reward of the cheese. Now, he called this the goal gradient hypothesis. The closer you were to the goal, the faster your efforts, uh, the more your efforts doubled, the faster you ran. So all sorts of experiments done in this. Here's an example, and they did this with you know coffee co coffee cards. They've done this with uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, car washes, all sorts of things. So the first experiment was buy ten get one free. The second one was buy twelve get one free, but the first two check boxes are already marked. Guess which one of these cards was redeemed faster? Even though they're mathematically identical, you still have to buy ten to get one, get, the, get one free. The people that had the psychological head start redeemed the cards faster. Psychology is a big deal. Understand and mitigate the risks. Instant coffee, when it was first introduced in the 1940s, was an absolute dud in sales. And when they realized, when they did the digging, what they realized was that a lot of, uh, this is the day of the stay of the home household. This is the 1940s, a long time ago. Don't string me up for what I'm about to say, right? What they realized was that the housewives were afraid of other housewives' opinions. What kind of, how, what kind of mom and wife am I if I'm going to use instant coffee? And so the instant coffee people had to reposition the coffee as a time saver for the housewife so that they would not incur the wrath of other housewives. And you can see the, the, what is it, approving glance of her husband here. I don't agree with this, but this was 1940 and that's the kind of thing that they didn't advertise. Same thing with instant cake mix. What kind of person would use instant cake mix? Obviously a poor planner and lazy. So they had to go back into the kitchen and say, we can't just you know, add water. Let's actually now get people to break an egg into it as well. This mere act of some psychological, some, some creative involvement reduced the psychological angst for instant cake mix to take off. I'm not going to use those. We're running a little out of time, but let's still go to uh, use trust marks. Trust marks are a big deal. Uh, you got people, if they've never heard of you before, they need to have heard of something about you before. And whether that is that you belong to this particular association or you're approved with this kind of regulatory body, whatever it is, right? And, you know, you see the opposite happening as well. All sorts of stories uh, about uh, doctors that turned out not to be doctors. So here's some of the headlines. Fake doctor gives physical exam to truckers in Carlisle. Fake Michigan doctor fooled hospital for 15 years. All these people did most of the time was wear the stethoscope, wear the actual, uh, what is that, smock, right? And have their name insignia on the side. And they were able to fool most of the people for a few months at a time, a few weeks. Now, I don't know how this guy got away with it for 15 years, but the trust marks allow you to bring trust in, first of all. Now, if you can back it up with the trust marks are legitimate, wow, you've got a way big head start on that. And hopefully you are legitimate in that process. Priming, don't rely on the la your first meeting with that client in order to close that sale. Prime the runway prior to that. You know? So the Boeing 747 was first, used, uh, first adopted in 1969. Now it needs two miles of runway to get off the ground. 
but sometimes it can get off the runway in a short of 6,500 feet. What it can't do is get off the ground in a thousand feet. That's highly dangerous. Yet we see people trying to get the sail done in that kind of timeline as well. Why not prime the sail? Here's an example of priming, right? So before you even decide to buy this bottle of wine, people paid the actual merchant played music above the bottles uh, sections. So when French music was played, Okay, um, in, the, uh, in the section, and they had two types of bottles of wine here, French wine and German wine. When French music was played, the ambiance, the environment, it sounds more French. It feels more French. 76%, almost 77% of the people bought the French wine, right? And only 26% bought the German wine. When the German music was played, you know, 23% only bought this French wine, where a full 73%, a whopping 73%, bought the German wine. By priming the environments at, before, and even after, you can significantly enhance your, your ability to close. Framing. Now, most people don't take advantage of the framing. I'm gonna sell you, sell you some coffee, right? Let's see if we can do this properly. You begin with a generic, toffee. I love toffee, but I'm gonna add some geographic element. Let's make it English toffee. Add a product type element, English crumble toffee. Add quality and nostalgia elements, premium, old fashioned, English crumble toffee. Now we're gonna put it into a narrative. Our premium, old fashioned, English crumble toffee is made with Jamaican sugar, golden dairy fresh butter, covered in Belgian gourmet chocolate, and then lightly sprinkled with orchard roasted almonds. It's a legendary family recipe we've kept secret for over 80 years. Now what would you rather buy? Toffee or premium, old fashioned, English crumble toffee? And the difference between that, you know, toffee and that premium old fashioned English crumble toffee is a huge amount in leverage in your ability to price. I'm gonna give you this idea of loss aversion. People don't like losses, right? And this is a little bit, a lot of text on here, I get it, right? Uh, but the bottom line says, you know, they offer two different types of, uh, of versions of how to combat the disease. So there's a disease coming, it's expected to kill 600 people, and you have to choose between program A, where 200 people will be saved, or program B is adopted, that a one-third probability of 600 people will be saved, and a two-third probability that no one will be saved. When they offered this choice, 72% of physicians chose the certainty of saving 200 people. Then they broke it up the other way. Now they framed it as a loss. If program C is adopted, 400 people will die. If program D is adopted, Nobody, one third probability, nobody will die. And two thirds, that's a uh, probability that 600 people die. When they chose it, uh, when they framed it as a loss, 22% of the doctors chose the certainty of killing 400 people, while a whopping 78% chose to gamble all the lives. Now, here's the thing. Mathematically, both these things are identical. But framing it as, you know, a gain or a loss results in completely different choices being made. Now, I think I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna go right to the final thing that I want you to really focus on. This is a big one. I just recently wrote a book on this. Uh, you can pick it up at Amazon. It's called The Seven Essential Stories Charismatic Leaders Tell. Story is a powerful aspect of what anybody does in taking their, um, uh, their products to market. So back in uh, the early 2000s, two guys, Joshua Glenn and Rob Walker, uh, put up a website. You can still look it up. It's called The Significant Objects uh, Project. Stories are such a powerful driver of emotional value that their effect on any given object's subjective value can actually be measured objectively. So here's what they did. They went out and bought a whole bunch of thrift store junk. There's some of the thrift store junk on the right. And they went and they paired it with a writer to write a fictional story around that thrift store junk. What was the name of the book? Seven Essential Stories Charismatic Leaders Tell. Each significant object is listed for sale on eBay along with a fictional story. And everybody knows it's a fictional story. So here's an example. That uh, egg whisk, 25 cents at the uh, thrift store. Final price, 30 bucks. <laughs> and here's a part of the story. Two days after his bypass surgery, she walked in on the nurse adjusting his catheter and dispensing dietary, dietary advice. No more omelets. Here's another one. Original price, a buck 99. Final price, 15.50. My daddy shouts at me whenever I go down the piggy bank. And he screams when I turn it upside down. What kind of family is that? Whoa. 
But look at the lift in price. Fake banana, this was done through a cartoon. 25 cents at the junk store, 76 whopping dollars when it was finally sold on eBay. Simply with the power of a story, in this case with a little cartoon. Final results, they bought 128 bucks worth of thrift store junk and they were able to sell it for $3,612 on eBay simply by adding a narrative to each one of those items. All right, hopefully I didn't go too far over. I think about three minutes out. So if you'd like a copy of this deck, uh, you'll get the missing slides in there as well. You'll, uh, it, it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, I'll send you a copy of this deck. Just connect with me on LinkedIn. Look me up there. I'm pretty easy to find, and I'll make sure you, I get this out, out to you. I'm pretty comfortable recording this uh, session as well, so you'll be able to see this in, uh, in uh, video as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Karen. That was great. Um, so we're going to uh, jump right into the second part of the presentation. And one of our uh, uh, Rick Center clients, uh, Costa, is going to tell a story about uh, his startup and uh, how he's uh, uh, acted uh, to prime a cell. And then we're going to have Q&A at the end. What's up, everyone? So you guys are here because you want to learn how to get your first 500 paying clients. Um, that's exactly what I'm going to give you. This is a no gimmick headline. I'm actually going to break down the playbook uh, I use and tell you how I got my company's first 500 paying clients through outbound sales uh, techniques, cold calling and email marketing. Um, as you can probably tell by the title of this talk, it's mostly geared towards early stage founders or folks uh, just starting out. Uh, but at the same time, I think the outbound principles can apply to any company that, that wants to do outbound. Now, I have to warn you, if you're looking for some secret formula or secret sauce uh, that's going to get you 500 paying clients, I hate to break it to you, but that does not exist. The process requires a lot of time, commitment, and dedication in order to succeed. So if you're up for the ch challenge, uh, ready to put in the work, then 500 paying clients is 110% achievable. This is what I did to get my first 500 clients. Here is my nine-step playbook. Uh, first thing you want to do is narrow in on a very defined specific niche. So for example, in my case, our customers were realtors. So if you ask me who my target customer is, I can't just say realtors. I have to be extremely specific. So for example, when I was starting out, what I did was zoom in on a very specific niche of realtors to target. So instead of just realtors, one segment I targeted was Toronto realtors that are part of Remax that don't have a website. So that is a very defined and specific niche. I, I have three attributes that are very personal. Their city, where they're from, uh, the company they work for, and the fact that they don't have a website. So I'm not saying the zoomed micro niche has to be your target forever. Obviously not. However, if you want to gain traction and earn revenue fast, you have to pick a very tightly defined niche, and then you attack it. So by defining that specific niche, what that does, it helps you with your messaging and your emails and phone script. Um, because you have such a defined niche, you're able to really personalize your communication to the point it literally feels like you're writing or calling that person individually and they're not part of uh, some sort of mass campaign. And the only way an email or phone script can feel that personal is if you have a, a very well-defined narrow niche. So using that same example, you know, if I said my target was realtors, that would be just way too generic, way too broad to write an effective cold email or phone script that didn't feel cold. Um, there are so many different types of realtors who do different things in different markets where it would literally be impossible to write an effective cold email or phone script. So look how this sounds now in an opening script with my well-defined niche. I can say, Hey, Susan, uh, this is Costa from web for realty I've been helping a few of your co colleagues in Remax set up the real estate website. Uh, I noticed you don't have a website currently. Was there any particular reason why? Uh, so that opening pitch is, is so personal that the lead really has no choice but to respond and continue the dialogue. Uh, if I were to target all realtors, it would be impossible to have an impactful opening script like that. Uh, it would be way too broad, way too generic. Um, you know, not all realtors are in Toronto, not all are with Remax, and some might have or might not have a website. Um, so this is why, and this is another reason why most people, I think, write off outbound sales as ineffective. Uh, they're just not defining their niche tightly enough. 
Um, and by the way, you can get very creative with your defined niches if you think hard enough. You know, the realtor example I gave is just a very simple and basic example of that. Number three, time to scrape the lead. So after you've defined your target niche, you've got to get you've got to get good quality leads in your system. Uh, how you attain these leads, I mean, there's several different ways. Uh, you know, you can scrape them manually yourself. This may not be the most efficient or fastest, but it's definitely an option. Uh, for example, there's tools like Hunter IO, which is a cool app or something similar. So research online, you know, you can get access to databases, et cetera. Um, Hire, hire someone on Upwork. I mean, you know, someone out there will have a method, tool, or some kind of resource to get you your leads. Uh, it's also really important that your leads are, are very good, high quality leads and accurate emails and phone numbers. Uh, that's important, or, or else your conversions and engagement will not be good enough to succeed. Um, I've seen a lot of people do all the right things in their outbound approach, but fall short because of poor leads. So make sure you're scraping your leads properly. Number four. So write an opening script and just be prepared, uh, you know, with objection handling and all that. It's important to be prepared when making cold calls. Uh, phone scripts get sort of a bad reputation, just the word scripts, I feel. You know, when most people hear phone scripts, they automatically think about, you know, that, that duck cleaning company or credit card company telemarketing you. Um, you know, by the way, I was actually one of those credit card telemarketers back in university. So um, shout out to all the telemarketers out there. Now, you absolutely need a sales script when cold calling. Remember, at least when you're starting out, you know, the most effective cold outreach should not feel cold. Uh, that's what makes it effective. Another misconception I see, just because you have a script, doesn't mean it has to sound like a script. This is key, like read it naturally. Uh, it, it comes down to what I said before and how it's written. Uh, remember, your writing should sound like you talk. Uh, so same with the script. If you write the script like you talk, then it, you'll read it how you talk and it'll just come out naturally and not like you're reading. Uh, also, make sure you practice a lot, do mock calls, be prepared, uh, but definitely have a well thought out script. Very important. Next, uh, time for action. You know, it's time to get your feet wet. You got to start calling. Uh, the objective of your initial phone call is basically to introduce yourself and capture just enough of the lead's attention to give you a few seconds. And finally, most importantly, you got to get them to say yes after you ask if you can send them a quick email. So once they do that, the sales process officially begins. You know, a lot of people think cold calling doesn't work because you know, they're trying to close someone on the first or second call. Not to say that's impossible because, you know, I've done quite a few first call closes. Um, <clears throat> but you, you always have to be mindful of the conversation and just take every call on a call by call basis. Um, but the primary objective on the first call is to get consent uh, to send them a quick email and put them in your email nurturing campaign. Um, don't need too many tools or get too fancy with this other than a phone and a CRM. Personally, uh, with my, our company, we use Aircall IO. Uh, it's a great cloud-based phone system. So, you know, in terms of CRMs, there's a whole bunch of options nowadays. I'll probably pick one where the CRM and email marketing components are uh, combined or integrate nicely. Um, you know, HubSpot, Customer IO, Close IO, those are all good options. Number six. So, after you get the go-ahead uh, that you can send the lead an email, you, you activate the email sequence campaign. So after you make a uh, hundred calls a day, every single day, and you know, getting consent from hundreds and hundreds of people, you'll have a very nice stream of leads in your email campaigns. And once they're in your email sequence, you'll have some really good information to make your follow-up calls more efficient. Now, again, I don't really want to get too granular on emails and what makes an effective email campaign. That's probably like a separate topic for another presentation, but I hope some of the frameworks and criteria I'm talking about will help with the email sequences at least. Number seven, follow-ups. This is key. So um, using the engagement metrics in your emails that are being sent out, you should, you should be following up with leads who are most engaged uh, or have the highest lead scores. Most marketing email companies have these features built in already. So for example, when you know leads are engaged in your emails, your follow-up calls now become supernatural and casual. So instead of just following up with everyone you speak to randomly, uh, by using these engagement metrics, you can be a lot more efficient with your time and, and target people who are most engaged with your emails. So for example, in my case, I remember having a notification pop up 
wrong to me when someone literally opens up an email and I would instantly call that person because I know most likely they're on the computer and they'll give me a bit of time to speak to them. Um, obviously, they wouldn't know I have those details, so I make it sound like I'm, I'm calling a, as a coincidence. But you know, little hacks like that definitely help, help speed up the sales cycle. And number eight, <clears throat> keep feeding the pipeline. So it's very easy to get complacent with this style of sales, especially uh, when you're building up your follow-up list and you have a lot of hot leads. Um, this happens almost always. Like it's happened to me. It's happened to salespeople I've hired. Uh, you just have to stay hungry and motivated enough where you dedicate at least two hours per day on prospecting and cold calling. Uh, it's very important. Actually, I'd say it's necessary and crucial uh, that you keep feeding and refreshing your pipeline to ensure sales remain steady and consistent. Um, week after week, month after month. If not, your follow-ups will run dry and sales will taper, taper off eventually. Um, you have to think of it like a constantly revolving machine of leads. You have to continuously pump into it. Uh, once you stop your cold calling, the machine stops. So you can never let that machine stop. And, and uh, number nine, capitalize on referrals. As you gain traction and you're providing amazing service to your earliest clients, uh, eventually referrals and inbounds will start trickling in. Uh, these are the best and the easiest sales to make, which will help contribute to your first 500 sales. Um, if you provide good service and value to your earlier clients, as I discussed, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll come up in conversation eventually. Uh, people like to talk. Referrals are easy sales. Uh, it's all about human behavior. You've got to understand it. So. These steps, uh, the framework, everything I'm talking about, it's, you know, nothing too crazy. Like it's super logical, super straightforward. Uh, this is true with anything. Any great speaker or business person with amazing insights, whatever they say is always very logical. Uh, the problem is that not too many people apply what's being taught or being said. You know, people are just consuming the information and going about their day. That's why a lot of these famous speakers and motiva motivators, they're uh, continuing to make a ton of money on their talks and information because really no one is applying it. You know, if people were actually applying what is being taught out there, then no one would have to listen to these people speak anymore. So the real challenge is execution. Um, and that's why most people fail or give up too early. They're not executing. When it comes to sales, people are, are trying to get too fancy. You know, they're jumping into the paid ads and going the cool route, the route that everyone's trying to sell you on. Um, the route that everyone seems to be an expert in all of a sudden, you know, no one's talking about the route that doesn't cost you any money uh, other than your time and a whole lot of effort, grind and commitment. And that's outbound sales. So, you know, if you're ready to put in that grind, that dedication, that commitment, then you can definitely succeed in outbound sales. And there should be real, no real excuse as to why you can't get your first hundred customers. But if I can get my first 500 sales in this way, then believe me, anyone listening can certainly do the same. Now, I really hope this helped uh, debunk the myth that cold calling and outbound sales doesn't work. Uh, I'm literally living proof that it does work. I personally know and speak to several other successful companies who do outbound sales effectively as well. So don't listen to the noise, put your head down, work hard, commit, and you will succeed in getting traction with, with outbound sales if you really want to. Uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, like I said before, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, I got a very unique name. Uh, you can book a time to chat with me on Growth Mentor for free. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Costapana and search me on LinkedIn. Um, by the way, as I said uh, in the intro, uh, I am giving away my free custom recurring revenue calculator to anyone who wants it. I built this myself because there was literally no accurate calculator out there that I can find uh, that also takes into account churn. Uh, so this is a really good little tool to have. Uh, I have to warn you, it's not the prettiest, but it works and it's awesome. So uh, the link to get it uh, should be in my talk profile page. Uh, if you can't find it, just send me an email and I'll send it to you. Uh, if you made it this far in the talk, thank you all so, so much. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you listening. I hope this was helpful. And uh, most importantly, best of luck on growing your business. That was fabulous. Thanks so much, Costa. Not, you know, I'm a strategy guy. I'm guilty just like everybody else at trying to come up with a way to have you know, the perfect strategic uh, fit in the world. But we don't talk enough about 
execution and the people that I know that are really successful in entrepreneurship and, uh, and in, you know, personal success, uh, execute uh, day in and day out. And I love the idea of the, you know, um, the filling the pipeline every day, even if you've got, you know, a healthy pipeline coming out the other end. So at this point, we've got another 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, we've got 42 people on, uh, on the call. So we've got two options. Um, uh, you can uh, post a question in the chat and, I'll, um, and I will uh, translate, or uh, it's okay if we just try an experiment for people um, just unmuting themselves and asking a question. If we get too many people talking over each other, then we'll go back to the chat option. So let's try either, uh, either option right now. Everybody's either uh, either your presentations were perfect. <laughs> Not or, all at once. Uh, yeah, I um, yeah, maybe I'll ask one, uh, Costa. You so a great recorded uh, presentation. Um, sometimes we just don't feel like it, you know. Like sometimes we're having one of those days where uh, we just don't feel like picking up the phone or sending a message, etc. Do you have any? Uh, because uh, in Curious presentation, we heard a little bit about kind of cognitive tricks that we can use to, to um, you know, more effectively market. Um, from your perspective, are there any little tricks that you use to kind of motivate yourself to sit down and make those calls? Honestly, um, I don't have a secret answer, like secret sauce secret pill for that. Like that's as cliche. I, I hate giving cliche answers, but it's, it's really, um, starts with your mindset and just having like a genuine desire and hunger to, to be the best at what you're doing. Um, personally, since I was very young, I, I've had a sort of a motto that I live by, which is no plan B's. So if it fits in my head and, and that's what, you know, I have my eyes set on, uh, like failure is not an option. So, you know, I'm doing what I can to, you know, to get it done. So yeah, cliche answer. It, it's really mindset and, and your attitude. So. Yeah, well done. We have a, a question posted online from Dustin to Costa. Is there a number that you say should be a minimum for outbound calls per day? Um, I, I don't think so. I think it's really um, could be industry specific. Depends who your customer is. Um, I, I remember easily doing a good hundred calls a day, like without any issue. So I guess it really depends on how many leads you have as well. So. There, there's no magic answer to that either. Let me, let me chime in on that. Uh, right out of university, many, many years ago, so almost 40 years now, I, uh, I'm probably the veteran of 20,000 cold calls over that time, right? A lot of them were absolute disasters and failures while I was trying to figure out how to do it. But I will tell you that uh, cold calls without a great big idea, whatever that big idea that directly addresses that customer's pain or gain points, uh, there's nothing worse than having, you know, uh, phones uh, slammed on you over and over and over again. But that's really not a function of your ability to cold call. That's your a function of your uh, ability to craft a big idea that people want to buy into. And when you have a big idea, when you had a really great product and you were able to succinctly uh, tell that big idea in a couple of sentences, a few words, then all of a sudden the audience comes alive, right? At least a bigger portion of that audience comes alive. And then that makes the cold calls a much more evangelical process than a, you know, rolling that boulder way up the hill, uh, which can be very discouraging. If you are getting slammed on uh, your phone calls, you know, be slammed on over and over and over again, you're not getting a proper take up. That means your story's wrong. You have to rework your story. Can I jump in on that as well? Just one point makes total yeah. sense. Um, I don't know if I, I necessarily fully agree with that because my, in my case, Web for Realty, we're probably in one of the most competitive industries I've ever seen, like real estate technology. So, so we didn't have that necessarily that big idea, but you know, we did have um, just the confidence and, and good messaging and 
you know, that was enough to. Yeah, I'll bet you were able to hit a pain point though, right? Clearly a pain point. And you know, if you're a real estate agent at Remax without a website today, you probably got a problem. <laughs> you need that just to stay competitive. So that's your big idea, actually. And the big idea is why aren't you doing this? It's so simple, and we got a dead simple uh, framework for you to use this. That's the big yeah, idea. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a unique big idea. It just has to be resonant to their pain and gain points. Yeah. There's an online question for you, Kieran. How was the advent of shopping tools and a more sophisticated buyer compared to some of your 1940 examples affected the concepts and approaches you covered? Um, it's actually uh, very much the same way. So I'm a partner in a digital marketing company as well, uh, Socialite Communications here. And in fact, I'm in the Socialite offices right now. And so we measure every uh, possible stage in that funnel. And at, at every stage in that funnel, as people are everything from awareness all the way down to conversion action, then resale, all that kind of stuff, you are telling them, you, you're using all the different psychological aspects to reassure them that they're making the right decision. By the way, the last thing we ever want to do is bring the wrong customer into the funnel and sell them the wrong product. That's just bad news for everybody. But to show people that they are making the right decision and they're in the right place, all of those cognitive aspects, you know, and those are you know, millions of years old. Uh, the way, um, well, it's not millions, it's several thousand years old, right? Ever since people started talking to each other. Uh, those are necessary elements to gain confidence, provide reassurance to go to the next step. And there's no such thing as a sale. They're sales as they go from stage to stage to stage down that funnel to final conversion. So all of those tactics that I showed you work digitally as well. And uh, they're just communicating in a different way. It might be video, it might be colors, it might be uh, you know, case studies, it could be a lot of different things. Yeah, maybe I'll just kind of weigh in on that uh, too. Um, what I often ask people um, is what they're closing for. You should be closing for something in every call and you're often not closing for the sale yet. You know, you're, you're closing for something that's a, an interim process, like for, a, for um, you know, a demonstration or a meeting or a, you know, some kind of conversion opportunity. So what are you closing for? And we, uh, in sales, we often talk about the, the, the Barney meeting. I oh, you just froze up on us. I don't have a Barney meeting and a Barney, a Barney meeting is uh, the purple dinosaur, you know, and it's uh, I love you, you love me, but at the end of the presentation, there's no action at it, right? So if you have a meeting and there's no agreement for next step, whatever that might be, then it was probably a waste of your time. Yeah, in fact, if we have eight stages in our digital funnel, uh, we're only measuring, we're measuring KPIs in between each of those stages. And the only sale we're trying to make is get somebody from stage one to stage two. That's the sale. They haven't bought anything yet. And then stage two to stage three. They still haven't bought it yet, but maybe they've subscribed to your, uh, what is it, tripwire offer or, or a newsletter or whatever have you, right? But they're buying something, if only in the way of time, effort, and maybe a little bit of money spent. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we've, got, uh, we've got the hour um, for the presentation. First of all, I just want to really thank uh, Kirian, Managing Director of Strategy Peep and COSA from Up for Realty um, for just our, their brilliant presentations. Um, we, w we have videoed this. We will be um, uh, uploading it onto the Rec Center website in the next couple of days. So you can go back and have a look at it again. Um, and uh, as, uh, as I think both uh, mentioned, there's an opportunity to submit a request for the slides if you would prefer that. Um, you can also, if you have feedback on to, you know, how we can do better presentation in the future, uh, feel free to weigh in to me at paul at paulbarter.com. And our next session, uh, July 7th, is on bootstrapping. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the beginning of the cycle, how, how to start from scratch. And uh, we've actually had two different um, clients uh, in our pipeline. I've got two different clients in my pipeline, and they do very similar things. One of them bootstrapped uh, to a multi-million dollar valuation. One of them raised really a lot of money in multiple rounds and has a valuation at, uh, you know, a couple of hundred times the valuation of the bootstrap fund. But the net equity left over for the founders is identical in both of those examples. Um, and in the bootstrap example, uh, you know, better quality of life and um, 
and a simpler world. So uh, the idea that you've got to raise millions or tens of millions of dollars, maybe not always uh, the right option for you. So thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, turn you loose. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Bye-bye.